Okay, um, it's really my distinct pleasure to be here. I remember back in 2006 attending the first event at, when I was still a graduate student and it was really meaningful to me to have see the work that's being done really at the intersection of people, places, and technology, which were areas which I was really struggling to fit together at the time. And it's, I've been, it's been really an honor to have worked with um, Omar Khan, Trevor Schultz, and, and Mark Shepard throughout the years on both the, the pamphlet and the exhibition and the book. And so I just wanted to thank very much the Architecture League for their support and for really putting an emphasis on this project, which I think is really important. Um, for, for the field um, of design and architecture and research more broadly. So I think when we think about data literacy, it sounds like that it would be a good idea to maybe start a uh, you know, college level curriculum and a series of classes about data literacy. <laughs> but what I'd like to propose is that every day we're generating data in our own experiences, we're participating in um, the creation of that data, as was mentioned in the previous panel, and we're confronting it in public spaces as well. And so, um, really my interest in, in the topic of big data really comes from the, um, the focus on how can we make more qualitative and um, more meaningful and explore those narratives and stories. So often big data, you know, we see a lot of numbers, and particularly in the mass media, it's often uh, the aggregation of all of these small, micro-level, socio-cultural practices. And so my interest is in really usually working at the, the micro-level, um, talking to people, interviewing people, observing um, as uh, both a participant and, and um, as, a, as a social scientist, really learning you know, why people are doing what they're doing. And that's really my interest um, in this discussion. Um, so we, of course, we want to understand the ways in which the socio-technical issues are related to behavior and to bits and infrastructure and whose data is being collected and how it's collected and aggregated and how it might be visualized and for what purposes it might be used. Um, and I'm just going to talk about a couple of driving th themes within my interest in the ways in which uh, the digital becomes embedded in, in our physical world. And as I you know, first thought about this issue um, several years ago, um, the discussion was really about how software was a new kind of architecture as advanced by Lawrence Lessig in his book Code. And my challenge was, well, um, you know, what happens when the code meets the physical place and doesn't map on in the ways that we imagine and where there's those um, mismatches and gaps and things that fall between, uh, between the digital world and the physical world. Um, so just as an example of the ways in which our digital networks are actually represent human practices, um, I have some slogans from the community wireless networking initiatives um, that I wrote about in the pamphlet. Um, and so in Berlin, the Freifunk group, the community wireless group, they say that they're a social initiative, but also a physical infrastructure. And in fact, they meet every week, they build antennas together, um, they, you know, they're both a social network, um, and they're providing that access to the internet. And the um, Austrian group, uh, Funkfeuer, they say, don't log into the net, be the net. So in the area of mesh, mesh networking, um, it's very obvious to the participants that they, they themselves are the infrastructure um, in that case. And here's just an image of what a mesh network looks like. Um, and one of my other interests is in you know, making more visible those invisible networks. And um, as an example, I have just a, a shot of uh, something that looked very curious to me when I encountered it on a beach um, in Central America, and you know there were these incredible designs all over the beach, these swirls and iterations, and, and we said, God, what could this be? Well, who could make these traces? And actually, it turns out, if you look very closely, they were snails. And they were moving very, very, very slowly, but when you aggregated it to look at the entire beach, you just saw the entire beach was covered with these patterns. Um, so that was a way of kind of making visible things that you basically don't pay any attention to unless Perhaps you're a biologist and studying snails. Um, and in the same way, we can look at digital networks. So here's an image from using a spectrum analyzer. You can actually read 
the Wi-Fi signals that are going to and from the nodes in the network. And using this particular one, you can see which nodes of the network are actually open, meaning that they don't require a pass password. Um, and you can see which ones are closed, and you can see kind of in general how much data is flowing through the different networks. And this was really important for me, um, you know, doing an, an ethnographic study of, of Wi-Fi use to be able to use these technical tools to uncover things that I couldn't, couldn't be seen with the naked eye. So um, for me, it was an important way of, of really making visible those digital signals that were invisible. And of course, I, I love to cite uh, Timo Arnold's work, um, the ways in which he brings RFID tags and talks about their materiality and their, their physicality and his other work on, on Wi-Fi spectrum and his light painting project in which he can show you what Wi-Fi looks like on the streets in London. So, um, and, and thirdly, the, the last point really is about how this, there's a kind of digital materiality um, that uh, is important to think about. And so even with with Wi-Fi networks, for example, there's a huge amount of solar panels and cables and equipment. So something that looks uh, is, is very difficult to see, there's actually a, a materiality to it. And in fact, um, if you use DVDs to move the data collected globally in 2010, it would require a fleet of more than 16 million jumbo jets, according to a recent article by the International Data Privacy Law Journal. Um, so I think it's important to, to bring that, the, you know, data to, to real uh, physical um, materiality and, and sort of explain that. So I'll just mention briefly a couple of the ways that in my teaching I've been uh, working with students to understand some of these themes. Um, and the first is using the values in design and values at play uh, card deck and exercise that Helen Nissenbaum and Mary Flanagan created. Um, to help students understand uh, the values that are embedded in uh, this, in this case, uh, using board games to try to embed values into the gameplay. And that's, uh, you know, a very uh, tangible way for students to get a better sense of, of where decisions are made and how they're made because they're actually designing a game trying to embed values like sustainability or privacy. Um, and then, in my course on networked objects, we did a number of exercises where students were challenged to design networked objects. And you know, even though some of them were superficial, like the refrigerator that can order your groceries, um, it forced them to have to think through the, the, both the opportunities and the constraints um, in, in making those decisions about these new potential um, networked objects. Um, and then in our project work, we've been working with two organizations. One is a small nonprofit in Toronto called Not Far From the Tree, and they're an urban farming organization. And with some support from the Canadian Fulbright Commission, we've been working with them to try to understand whether their model of urban farming maps onto the Chicago context. Um, and so in that project, they've actually considered trees as part of uh, the Internet of Things. And so they've, they've uh, explored the ways in which trees can tell stories, whether teams of volunteers are going, for example, to pick fruit, um, where how that data could be uh, embedded into a mobile application to tell, tell the teams you know, where the fruit uh, is ripe, which residents uh, would like their fruit picked, uh, all of the different grooming information that's needed. And so they've had to look at you know, government information databases about how to take care of trees, and they've interviewed uh, a number of uh, elders in the Chicago community that are very active in, in grooming their fruit tr trees. And the ultimate goal of that is to uh, come up with a mobile application that will allow this organization to uh, better mobilize teams of volunteers and, and figure out what information could be uh, embedded in the application. And the second team is working with the New America Foundation's Open Technology Initiative uh, on a mesh networking project. and they've been able to, to go to Detroit and understand, uh, you know, really uh, at the level of the community level, um, you know, who might be served by a potential mesh networking project and maybe who, who isn't served. And also just the, the broad disconnect, I think, between the understandings that, that the technology community has and that of, uh, you know, sort of regular citizens in Detroit. And neither of these projects is complete yet, and our, their final presentations are next week. So I don't have um, any results to report yet, but uh, thank you very much. <laughs>